All right. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Pittsburgh Healthy. This is exciting today. And, you know, our journey through life, we want to be as healthy as we can. We don't want to just make Pittsburgh healthy. Of course not. We want to make this world healthy. Um, and I thank everyone for listening. Please share this and get more people on this, on this show so we can change the community, change the world. Health is incredible. When you have your health, you can do amazing things. And today we have V Capaldi. She is the paleo boss lady. And don't let the title fool you. This is not a paleo talk. She'll probably interject some things, but you're going to be so inspired, motivated, and empowered by the time you're done. Listen to every minute. You are going to conquer your next mountain. Listen to this. By the age of 23, she was told she had an inoperable brain tumor and lived the next six months believing her life was over. Can you imagine that? And as luck would have it, that death sentence became a life sentence where she was told she had multiple sclerosis. So you're going to hear an inspiring journey, how she broke this, how she's changing lives and her community and all over the world. So uh, V, thanks for being on the show today. I'm really excited. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you like to do for fun and what gets you up in the morning. Oh, these are some of my favorite questions. Thank you so much for having me. And I love Pittsburgh. So I have to big a shout out to you because I'm from <laughs> Philly and that whole P I just love the state of Pennsylvania and I've been and slept in every state in America. So I'm coming from a very educated lens. Um, what gets me up in the morning is the strong desire to honor mother earth and the sunrise. So I get up pretty much seven days a week to do yoga to the sunrise with candles lit, usually Nag Champa or Palo Santo, something sort of being diffused essential oils in the air. Uh, meditation practice and um, just to live another day. So my mornings are the most special time of the day. I live, I rush to go to bed because I can't wait to wake up in the morning to get on the yoga mat and just to, you know, especially this time of year, it's, it's like a bird symphony. I just open my windows and me and the birds just, you know, get so excited about the sun coming up. So that is how I start my day. And what my passions are, are um, just creating awareness, I would say, is, is you know, in, in life and living. But I live and my love language is in cooking. And uh, I'm an avid gardener. So I would say that growing food, cooking food, and um, just sharing uh, consciousness, uh, you know, really just leading by example. I really don't do anything where it's like, well, I should do this so you should do it. It's more just sort of a collective consciousness, living in a collective consciousness. I love it. And you know, the, the, what you just said, every morning, do you really do that every morning? You know, I have to tell you that I struggle to give myself a day off. I am a super type A overachiever with uber high expectations. So when I don't wake up and do yoga, there I'm a self myofascial release expert. There's ball rolling or there's dancing. Um, today I laid in bed until 5:30, which normally I get up at three or four. I go to bed between seven and eight p.m. Um, so today I stayed in bed a little later. And when I woke up this morning, I just did some basic stretching and some band work. So maybe not full yoga, and I didn't have my normal whole thing, but I, I don't ever really wake up after the sun. I wake up to honor the sun. I mean, I'm usually at my garden at six. I'm at the grocery store at seven. Like by 10 o'clock, I've had a full day's work. My <laughs> like, stuff is done. But that also has a lot to do with biohacking. I live with multiple sclerosis, Epstein-Barr, Hashimoto's, and most probably Lyme disease. And um, I biohacked my life to follow a circadian rhythm and a lot of the cognitive issues that MS presents for me seem to really rear their ugly head no matter how hard I try, like two in the afternoon on. So if I want to really live my best life and you know conquer and seize the day, it, I work best that way. So um, a lot of it is, you know, a lot of the way I do things is because I want to live optimally in my body and this is what it takes. Well, you, you proved my point, and, and I didn't pre preface this before talking to you. Successful people do successful things, and I do the same thing. I, I plan to sleep in, and 
I'll set my alarm at six just in case I sleep till six and I never, it never goes off. <clears throat> and, um, I always, I do the same thing. I have a morning ritual that preps my day and I want to extract life out. So everyone who's listening, that alone is a gold mine drop. You've got to start your day successful. If you get up and listen to the news and you listen to garbage, you start the day with garbage, you're going to be garbage. You've got to start the day power. So let, let you know, you had a life changing event so serious, so powerful that probably knocked you on your back so hard. You thought this is it. I'm over. And, yeah. and we don't, have to get there to have a life-changing event but let's can you tell your story you know when you when you were diagnosed with that at age 23 tell us your journey that to, to, that has created this empowerment in you that created this success habits and we have to take what you've done we have to use your experience and your challenges to as a platform to create our own life so i, I appreciate you you sharing with us let's let's dive into your into your journey here Okay, well, um, when I was finally diagnosed with MS, there was, you know, this was back before really MRIs and, you know, we're talking the 80s, so science has changed a lot since then. Um, but once I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, they told me three, really three things. One is, here's Valium, which I didn't want because my mom was a prescription pill. My mom was an opiate addict my whole life, so I didn't want that. Don't go in the sun. Um, and I was raised in Philadelphia, but we always lived at the Jersey Shore in the summer. Like I still am a beach girl. Like I go to the beach several days a week. I live for the beach. The beach is my greatest health care. So telling me not to go in the sun. And um, the third thing was don't become a mom. And I was new. I was only married six weeks when I got sick. I got the hepatitis vaccine. I had symptoms of MS start the next day. Whole nother conversation. Um, so the three things that they told me to do, I didn't listen to. I didn't take opiates. I chose to use marijuana, cannabis, which was illegal in 1987, um, which I still use to this day. I um, was newly married and decided I'm going to get pregnant, which I did. And it put me into remission for 11 years, the exact opposite of what they said. Mm. And I've never not gone to the beach, been out in mother nature. And um, I still to this day don't overheat my body because ultimately that is what disabled me or, or brought on a disabling attack. Um, but the reality was, is I was diagnosed with MS. I'm a type A overachiever. I sought out the best healthcare you could find. I also was on the board of directors of the National MS Society. I was part of the test group for the disease modifying drugs that, because when I was diagnosed, there were no treatments for MS. So as treatments were becoming established by pharmaceutical companies, which were very expensive drugs, I was a willing participant to be a guinea pig because I, I believe that that was the only way we were going to help MS was with a pharmaceutical intervention. Um, so I went on disease modifying drugs, which, you know, Aaron, they're not supposed to make you better. They're just supposed to stop disease progression. So if you lost any abilities from MS, they never told you that they would bring them back with these drugs, but they said it would stop the progression and that you had to agree to be on them for the rest of your life. Uh, the initial price at that time was $2,500 a month for one disease modifying drug. Holy moly. Yeah. So um, I took those disease modifying drugs and I went to PT and I did everything the doctors told me. And um, by the age of 37, I became legally disabled from the effects of MS on my body. And what that looked like was, this was after seven exacerbations, which is severe MS body traumas where I'm getting, you know, chemotherapy dose steroids, you know, in the hospital, intravenouses. Uh, the medication that I took for MS gave me flu-like symptoms one day a week. So I took that drug for 19 mm. years. So for one day a week, for 19 years, mm. I laid in bed with a high fever and feeling terrible. And that was an acceptable side effect of the drug. Do you know how? So that means having MS, I was giving up one day a week for my life taking this drug. That was without even MS bothering me. That was from the drug that was supposed to stop MS. So I was, I was already down to only six days a week that I could properly function. And when you have an MS attack, or at least when I did, I, it would take me like three years to to just like be able to have a day without crippling fatigue. And mm -hmm. so I lost bilateral use of my hands, highest form of disability a person can have. Imagine if you can't use your hands. Now, 
for me, I could use my hands to do, it was repetitive motion that messed me up. So I could pick up this jar once, I could shake a person's hand once, the second time, maybe a little bit, but by the third time, I would get, get rigid, like my hand would get stuck either in an open or a closed position and just stay that way, almost like a metal rod. Like you can't, you'll see a lot of people with MS, their legs are like just straight out and you can't push it or bend it. It's rigidity. So I had that in my hands. I also couldn't move my head left or right or up or down. So imagine when you want to talk to people, you just have to look, you know, I would be, you know, I have to look at them because I, I drive, being on a plane was terrible because I, I couldn't read anything, I couldn't do anything, I just had to sit there straight. If there was, it was just so many things uh, when you can't move your head. I had involuntary limb jumping, so what is that? Even from the initial onset of MS, I had facial twitching, which grew to be like this, almost like a Tourette's kind of response, but my limbs would flail. They would, lit my spasms were so bad, that you could put a, an acupuncture needle in me and just watch the needle go like this until it just bent. Like I was literally like constantly and um, fatigue, cognitive issues. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying, no feeling on the left side of my body from the age of 23, still could not, you could punch me and I wouldn't feel it on the left side, punch me on the right side super hypersensitive reflexes. Um, like if you touch my knee, I would punch you. It was like so unsettling for anyone to like touch my legs or um, uh, restless leg. I mean, just terrible, constant pain. The good news and bad news was, is that I, I went into remission after I got pregnant with my daughter. And in that time I built international tech companies, type A overachiever me, and ended up you know, with millions of dollars in the bank, like millions, you know, living the American dream. So when, um, when I became disabled, what happened was is I was walking on the beach in, in Jersey in the summer and it was really humid and my body overheated. And MS is a hyperimmune system. I couldn't get my body temperature down. So a week later, I'm in air conditioning. I'm still sweating. I'm hot. Like I can't cool down. And that triggered the attack that literally just took me down. And what that meant was like every week MS was just in charge can't see, blind, double vision, can't think, can't move my body, falling, balance. I mean, just unbelievable. I had to, I, you know, sold the house I raised my daughter in because I couldn't do stairs, like making, living in one floor, you know, doing everything I can. And I finally realized that living in Philadelphia, you know, we can go from negative to a, over a hundred in a year. I had to stop that temperature change to maybe have a fighting chance. So the day my daughter went off to college uh, to Boston, I went moved to California. I moved to Venice Beach, California, because you could literally, this was 15 years ago, live at the beach without heat or air conditioning. And I thought, now that's going to give me a chance to start the fight back if I'm not dealing with these body temperature issues because heat makes me jelly and the damp cold on the East Coast gives me so much joint pain that I just cry in pain. I can't move. So there's no starting position when you literally can't get out of bed. So moved to California, not knowing anyone. And it really initially seemed like the best idea. Became a yoga instructor, became a spin instructor, was living at the beach, going to the beach every day, had money in the bank, still taking the drugs, still doing the Western medicine. Um, until one day I fell right like ms just sometimes makes you just fall i just fell and that fall triggered the worst spasming event of my my entire body was just a spasm that i no longer could control i now had that full-time help i could not use my hands i had people living with me and in the united states if you have a debilitating disease and you are disabled you are only allowed to physical therapy eight appointments a year that Medicare will pay for, maybe 12, which I always classified for the 12 because I had enough issues. But my hands didn't work and I needed PT three days a week. I needed 90 minute therapeutic body work sessions. I needed acupuncture. I also couldn't feel to use the ladies room just to be able to feed myself, dress myself and wipe myself. And in America, if you need those things, you have to pay for them. And I paid for them. 
$150 visit, three days a week, physical therapy, $90, therapeutic body work, twice a week, $125, acupuncture, just to maintain dignity, just to try and hang on, just to stay in the fight, full-time help, people living with me, money pouring out till I spent over two and a half million dollars in liquid assets. I had $80,000 left in the bank when I had to let my help go because I knew that that last 80,000, like I wasn't getting better, I was getting worse. I took 50,000 and I built a wellness center in Los Angeles that offered all those therapies. And I figured, well, if I own the thing, I'll get the things for free. Thought it was the greatest idea ever. Um, actually, I have a really strong moral lens and I ended up resigning leaving my own wellness center because I did it with uh, my physical therapist and we did not see eye to eye. Um, so uh, I wanted a community-based center. It basically serves only white privilege. So I resigned from my own center and this was nine years ago. So now I only have a little bit of money in the bank, no live-in help, and I'm really in trouble. So I went to Burning Man. <laughs> which is a festival in the desert where they build it. You know, it's, it's a no, I went there for three reasons. One, you're cut off from the outside world. Two, it's no judgment, no consumerism. It's literally like hippie love. What's mine is yours. Free world, be whoever you are. I needed all the noise of, of culture, societal norms. I needed to shut it all down. And the third thing and most important thing was, is they built a temple and I needed to go to the temple because I was considering suicide. And I needed to have that honest conversation with myself about ending my life. So I went to Burning Man. Everyone in my camp is like partying all night, doing drugs. I'm going to bed at 11, waking up at eight, they're out, still out. Like I did my own Burning Man, literally. Was in the temple and it just became clear to me in the temple, like the fourth day, this message from a higher power that our healthcare system is consumer driven. And maybe doing everything right was the wrong thing. And maybe the fact that I just was someone that I had a problem, went to the doctor, did what they told me, and that was it. Like, I really didn't have a role in my wellness beyond pharmaceuticals. And everything that they were giving me for pharmaceuticals was supposed to stop MS, but yet I'm getting worse. And it's causing other things. So now I'm on 14 drugs, like it was just terrible. So I decided at Burning Man that I was gonna come home, pretty much cut myself off from the outside world. And if I couldn't figure it out at the end of the year, I was gonna take my life. And by the grace of God, during that whole time, my physical therapist happened to mention to me that she had given up gluten. Maybe I should give up gluten. So I gave up gluten, started having positive results. And then after Burning Man, Dr. Terry Walls, Mining Your Mitochondria, TEDx, comes to social media, and I watch it. Here she is saying she has MS. She's developed this eating protocol, which is basically a modified form of paleo. I'd already been somewhat dabbling in paleo because once I gave up gluten and had a good response, then the evolution of looking at food continued till I got to a, a paleo lens, which was helping me, but then Dr. Wall's protocol, which was a lot of vegetables and not as much meat, helped me even more. And to make a very long, drawn out story short, today, as far as we know, because I take no drugs and I see no Western medicine doctors, I totally manage all of my healthcare myself. I manage every symptom from multiple sclerosis, Epstein-Barr, Hashimoto's, and probably Lyme disease 100% by myself using only diet and lifestyle interventions and my out-of-pocket could healthcare costs other than for like supplements and testing, you know, fecal studies, urine, saliva, blood, you know, all that that I do with a functional medicine practitioner. I don't spend any money on healthcare at all after exhausting two and a half million dollars in cash, listening to Western medicine and being sick. And here I am, I spend nothing and look at me. Wow. <clears throat> this is this is fascinating. And let me ask you this. When you went to Burning Man, how old were you? What was your age then? It was 2010. I'm so, 57. Okay, so from the from the mid mid 80s, you get diagnosed, you live your life with meds, and your condition doesn't correct itself. You you have serious bouts the whole time. 
You're developing more and more medications. Your life is being transformed. How you ever made that much money in the situation you're in, it was, that was like a godsend. Because if you didn't have the money, you would have, who knows what would have happened. But you end up going to Burning Man. You get, and if, no one, if you don't understand Burning Man, you have to, I've, I've checked this out. This is like a modern day Woodstock, I, I guess. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, all I hear is and there's some really rational people that go. And they say, just be open-minded. <laughs> That's all yeah. I know. I don't know the inside scoop. But, you know, look it up. But, you know, so you, you have this epiphany. Okay, we, something has to change. You start going natural and your body starts to not only calm down, but you start to heal and you don't need the whole, the whole gamut of these drugs and everything else. Uh, let's dive into that. I mean, it, people are thinking, well, okay, I'll, I'll take a, what supplement? The, you know, what, is it, a, right. is it a supplement? There's not one. It's like, if, it has to start with a mindset. You have to get to a point, you say, screw it, I'm done. I am not doing this. I'm not going down that path. And then that gives you the fight inside you to say, there, if I want to live, you could have lived the way you were living and lived mm -hmm. in a nursing home and lived crippled. Or you say, you know what, let's try to get life out. And if I get life out, just maybe <laughs> it's possible. It turns around. If not, who cares? You're dead you know, and then you move on. So you chose a better path. Let's, let's dive into that. I, I, I'm, I'm sure our listeners are so curious, like, what the heck did you do? What are you doing? Stole samples? What is this? Right. And it's, it's a barrage of everything. You have to find, when you're getting into functional medicine, health, healing, and people come into it with chiropractic, and I've had some MS patients with chiropractic, and changing their structural spine that takes pressure off their spinal cord, we've had amazing results just on that end. So you can't just dive in and say, one aspect, I'll just, I'll just change my diet. It wasn't just gluten for you. That was the start. That was yeah. the, probably the, the trigger that said, huh, if this can make a little change, what can happen? So tell us about that. It's interesting. Um, I mentioned that they offered me opiates in the beginning. And I was very grateful that I had a friend that reached out to me and said, essential oils and cannabis. So kind of from the very beginning, I did incorporate some holistic stuff following Western medicine, but it wasn't like I wasn't consciously thinking about it that way then. And I will tell you that still to this day, that a number one thing that helps my spasms is cannabis. So the fact that, and, and essential oils have been huge. I went on to build an award-winning aromatherapy store, a type A overachiever. Like we can go on and on and I can keep telling you all these accomplishments that I've done in the face of MS. I'm a crazy person. So I really got into essential oils and aromatherapy. So I was always known as kind of a hippie, even though I was on the board of the National MS Society, even though I was taking the drugs. So um, the second youngest and largest population living in institutions in America are people with MS. So I knew that there was a very strong possibility from the very beginning that that was the trajectory for me and the path that I was following. It was looking like, well, this is where I'm going. And having all that money was a godsend because I was able to spend money on uh, acupuncture, which is what gave me bladder function. No Western medicine doctor. I did go to a chiropractor. We, like my daughter will tell you, I went to a chiropractor my whole childhood. My mom, I got massages all the time. I did have a Western medicine doctor that insisted on physical therapy and massages. And I was fortunate enough to actually, my first physical therapist went on to be one of the owners of the Philadelphia 76ers, Pat Croce. Pat Croce literally trained me with the Sixers and the Flyers. And I got great training from PTs and chiropractors where I did what they told me. And I have a huge bag of tricks with skills from decades of uninterrupted PT that again, I spent money on chiropractic, massage. And those things were always what was sustaining me without side effect, you know, but yet I'm taking these pills and I'm getting a side effect. So by the time Burning Man came and I had that epiphany and I'm living in Venice Beach, California, California is a whole, it's its own country. I have to tell you, it's just very different here. It's, you know, they were using, you know, I studied psychotherapy and only graduated in 2014. And I was, you know, we are trained how to use ketamine and ayahuasca for, to help people with trauma. And that is now like people think we're crazy, but that's the teachings here. You know, it's just a different. So moving out to California, um, I started studying Buddhism. I started doing silent meditative retreats with monks. I became certified in yoga. I'm now going to the beach every day, which I was before, but now it's like, I must because it's healthcare. Um, I studied narrative therapy. I put myself back in school and got a master's in 
bachelor's in psychology when I could only use my voice to activate the computer. Like I'm sick as could be. And I decide I'm going back to school to work on my mind, doing all this stuff. And when I made the dietary changes, it was the last piece of the divine healing puzzle. And one by one, I wasn't having symptoms of what I was taking medication for. So when I would go to my Western medicine neurologist at Cedar sinai I would say to her, I don't need to take this drug anymore. I don't have that. So little by little, we would go off the drugs. And then eventually, because of really issues with, uh, I took that interferon, beta seron for 19 years, I injected. Um, and I was only allowed for the almost 18 years of it to inject in my gut and my butt every other day. And I had terrible scarring. My buttocks and my stomach were purple, like fresh bruises, black and blue. And I was constantly injecting in these bruises. And I was drinking about a bottle of wine a night to put that needle in me. I'm not going to lie because the pain was just so excruciating. And they kept telling me I had to do this for the rest of my life. And I kept telling them I can't take this medicine. And now that I'm healing, like, why do I need to take this medicine? Like, I think I'm presenting the best version of myself to go off this medicine. And the doctors wouldn't hear me. And instead they dismissed me from the hospital and told me they would never see me again mm -hmm. if I wasn't willing to do drug therapy. And then the pharmaceutical company asked me to record a disclaimer stating that they weren't gonna be legally liable for any results in my body and that I knew, I acknowledged that I was ill-advised, that I was advised not to go off the medication and I was doing this at my own risk. And it was at that point that I realized that There was nothing in Western medicine that they had done other than my doctor putting me in PT and therapeutic body work that that was helping me or sustaining me or even giving me any relief. And that the reality is that if I wasn't willing to treat MS with drugs, there was nothing for me in Western medicine. So I started reaching out to Dr. Terry Walls, like hunting her down. And eventually she responded. And I went to Paleo FX and met Dr. Walls in the paleo world and Dave Asprey and Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf and all the leaders and learned about biohacking, Dr. Will Cole, you know, and just learned about biohacking. And today, I don't even care if people are paleo. It was just, I was, you know, when I was doing paleo, I didn't know anybody who was paleo. And people, my friends got annoyed with me talking about it. So they're like, you're so bossy. You should just be paleo boss lady and talk about it on the internet and stop talking to us. And I started doing that and it grew to be this brand and that's kind of how, but really I just think paleo works for me. It may not work for you, whatever works for you, but it's really a consciousness. It's, it's really, for me, my healing has been an awareness of cultural societal norms married to me living my best life biologically, psychologically, and physically. So yes, food was the last piece of my puzzle, but the reality is, is that this entire journey is based around consciousness and, and not believing that drug therapy is always the only answer. And I believe that's the last resort and not the first resort. And I, I think the whole cultural, from watching Sesame Street and, you know, cartoons as a kid, we're brainwashed. Um, I, my daughter has, and I've lived, my kids have lived a, a completely healthy chiropractic life. No drugs, no shots, none of this stuff. Well, my daughter was about four years old. And she said to me one day, <clears throat> Daddy, I, I don't feel good. I need a shot. And I'm like, it's like talking Russian. I'm like, you've never seen a shot. You've never seen a doctor besides me. I'm like, how did you even come up with that? We couldn't figure it out. I'm like, it's TV. It's TV. She's whatever she's watching. We didn't watch much TV. And I thought, all right, done, done with the TV stuff. We're, we're done with that. Um, but it's a cultural thing that we get stuck on. Yeah. But my doctor said, my doctor said, and many times until we collide and we're, I'd love to dive into this cultural collision you, you address is until we collide with maybe our own our own awareness, our own consciousness, that wait a second, this is my life. You I I tell patients, I said, if your doctor isn't doing what you want, fire them. They yeah. go home to their nice house, nice car, nice family, whatever, and you go home with your sickness. 
I said, stop it. You need to find somebody that will help you. And if they can't find somebody, I say the same with me. I said, if I'm not doing my best, then get rid of me. Go, go to somebody better. And that is, unfortunately, it, it takes maybe years or sometimes decades of insult to our own body that we finally say, I'm sick of it. And we're trying to wake the culture up. That's what I love about this show and listening to you. I pray that people say, wait a second, I don't even want to go down that path. Um, we, maybe I should start interjecting some of these things now, paleo, keto, whatever. Uh, you mentioned Dave Asprey. I, I have followed his stuff for years. I've read his books. I, I'm always on this stuff reading. And I, I, I don't know a, a lot. I think I know a lot, but I don't know a lot because there's so much out there. But it, yeah. it's like you said, a journey. You start, you start down that path. And whether it's keto, full keto, whatever it is, you start down that path. So why don't you talk about this cultural collision? I, I think this is going to smack people right in the forehead that we have to address. We need to make changes. And unless my kids can be, I tell them, you can be twice as healthy as myself and your mother because you started life like this. And your kids can be even healthier. We're changing our culture in our, in our house. And I'm trying to change the culture in my office in my town. And I do it, like you said, I do it by example. I just, I think, and I think we're both on the same crazy part, but we're, <laughs> we're not nuts. We're crazy, but we're not nuts. And I, people say, you're crazy. I said, but I'm living a really good life. Right. I can still play rugby. I'm 54. I can do more pull-ups than you. I can run and play and I can beat my kids in sports. I said, I'm having fun and I'm on no medication. So let's jump into this cultural collision. I love where we're going. I love your energy. So, and I, I'm sure the listeners do. I love yours too. And, and I got to tell you, I, I will, I have a daughter. I mean, she's pregnant right now, but I bet you if you put the two of us and she's 32 side by side, I would kick her butt all day long, <laughs> awesome. any, any gym. Um, but, um, you know, for me, I think that the biggest part that I came back from Burning Man was that my eyes weren't truly open. So once I started opening my eyes, I identify very strongly as a Philadelphia Italian. I was raised very culturally Italian. So what does that mean? Italians spend time with Italians, with your family. It's all family. Sundays, the whole family gets together. It's all about making your own food. It's all about eating. It's about playing poker. It's literally, we would eat Sunday dinner, clear the table, play poker with our pennies, nickels, and dimes. Like, <laughs> but it's family. And because my mom was an addict, my family saved my life. So family was even more important to me culturally because they all knew what was going on with my mom. So they you know, jumped in and sort of saved me and my sisters. So those Sundays... And, and what happened around that Sunday table was for me, the most important thing in my life. The challenge was, is that gluten, peppers, tomatoes, and eggplant, which are high inflammatory foods, I could no longer eat. Well, the reality is that's all we eat. Italians, that's what we make, pasta, pizza. Like by the day of the week, I would know what we were having. Tuesday and Thursday was kind of a crapshoot, but it was a rotation of like five things. Like, we only ate the foods that I couldn't have anymore. And when I presented this to my family, they couldn't hear it because our culture tells us how we're supposed to live and act. And in my biohacking journey of wellness, I realized that there were a lot of choices that I was making that were very subconscious that I wasn't fully aware of. And it wasn't just my culture, it even went further to be just the autopilot of life. Like you and I spoke about, you know, an alarm clock, you know, waking up to an alarm clock. Every time I woke up to an alarm clock, I jumped out of bed scared to death. Mm -hmm. So when I started biohacking my life, it's like, why do I set an alarm? Like, why do I wake up that way? Is there a way that I can live a life like farmers used to and just wake up with the sun, the, the cycle of earth, you know? And that's how I do it. I never set an alarm clock anymore because Again, I biohacked that, but culture tells you, you set an alarm clock, so you're on time. You did, the, you know, that's what. So I have to tell you that I have literally, even having the Paleo Boss Lady page, it was not my idea. Someone was annoyed with the fact that I was eating paleo and constantly they would invite me somewhere and I'd be like, what? 
I, I have to bring my own food. Oh, I, I can't go out to eat in that restaurant or I can't do this or because I'm eating paleo now and people would get annoyed with it. So they came to me and were like, we're tired of hearing about your paleo nonsense. Open up a social media page and talk to people that care. It wasn't a positive, oh, we're so proud of you. They're watching me heal. I'm losing weight. No, people were mad at me. I lost more friends and family in my healing journey because I was literally looking at my culture and colliding with it and literally saying, no, I do not believe that eating pasta three days a week made with white flour is a good look and I'm not going to do it anymore. And my family didn't embrace that. I had to be willing to collide with my culture and stand alone. And I have to tell you, I feel like where I am in life right now in 2020 is exactly the same place I was in 2010 when I started making these bold moves. I feel like I am standing alone in COVID, Black Lives Matter, and a lot of things in life because, you know, my lens oftentimes since I've become conscious may, it doesn't typically follow cultural and societal norms. Um, so I, I believe that anyone that wants to live a conscious life is going to have a collision with their culture. You know, I did a TEDx about that. And I believe that how you respond to that collision is going to make or break your ability to truly live optimally because at the end of the day, Aaron, what works for you is not necessarily what's going to work for me. That's why I share leading by example. And I'm not here to tell you to eat paleo. I'm not here to tell you to go to bed at eight o'clock. I'm here to tell you to get in touch with what your body psychologically, spiritually, physically needs to move optimally. For me, it's yoga. It's self myofascial release. It's grounding. It's tons of vitamin D. It's playing in dirt. It's meditation. It's having a dog. It's being an extreme minimalist. It's, you know, eating paleo, growing my own food. I spend three hours a day on conscious movement just to be able to move my body every day. Again, I try and give myself that day off, but I just can't because A, I'm too type A and B. The reality is if I give myself a day off that next day, I don't move as freely. And I'm sorry, I, I just want to move. I just want to move as freely as I can. So it involves a commitment of every single day. And I really do it because I love myself, not because I'm afraid of MS. That's another powerful thing. I'm madly in love with myself. And I think before I was able to own who I was and before when I just followed my culture and followed what life told me based on gender, where I lived, my neighborhood, what school I went to, all of that, it created the space for my body to blow up because there was really no authenticity. And I didn't think I was inauthentic. I just didn't realize that I just did a lot of things because I was told that's what I needed to do. And not just like when the doctor said, take the drug. I never asked a question other than the disease modifying drugs, which they tell you is a lifelong commitment. I never asked the question when they gave me like Neurontin, how long do I have to be on this? There was never a just, just here, oh, you have that, you have uh, MS rib girdle here, take this drug. Okay. But I never said, what are the side effects? How long do I have to be on this drug? What should, uh, they, they just were going to have me on it forever. And there, no one was ever going to talk to me about going off the drug. You know what I mean? Like I never had any conversations, but yet I was putting stuff and doing things to my body just because somebody told me to. Like almost everything I was doing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think <clears throat> we're all guilty of that. And it's, it's sad but we got to get to a point that we wake up and the, 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 you're not telling them to be paleo or biohack this way or, but you know what we have to, the only way we're going to figure it out is try it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I used to try to work out at five in the morning. I hate it, but I can work out at seven or eight and work out harder than ever. I don't, I can't work out at night cause I'm tired. So I figured, but I'm going to work out. You're not going to stop me from working out. Um, you have to try these things and say, you know what, let me see if I can wake up on my own. And if you try that, you better go to bed early because if you're not, if you go to bed late, it's hard to wake up in after four or five hours. So you have to go to bed early. I go to bed at 10. I wake up around five, five thirty, sometimes earlier. And I do live on a farm. I have a farm. I have cows and sheep and goats, I love chickens. And I get to walk around in, I don't hit the manure, but I maneuver around that, but I get to enjoy earth. 
just like it's so disconnected from society. It's so cool because my cows and sheep just look at me and just smile. <laughs> but, you know, and the thing too that, you know, you get up and you do this, these three hours of intense body training, mind training, and people are, you're listening going, oh my gosh, I'm glad I don't have to do that. But you know what? You have to do it. Maybe yeah. it's not three hours, but you have right. to do something. People say to me all the time, oh, Doc Tresser, you, you, you love exercise. And I look at my, like, I don't love exercise. I love how I feel. I love when I play with my kids and I can outdo them. I love when I go to rugby practice and I can make a cut on somebody who's 20 and score. And they look at me and go, dude, you're, you're like grandpa. How do you do that? That's what I love. But the only way to love that, that one moment of glory, because <laughs> the, right. the rest of it, I'm hurting. The one more moment of glory is I have to get, I have to work out five, six days a week. I, I can never take time off. I always have to be in shape. So you've incorporated that. Unfortunately, it was through trauma, stress, and trial. But you know what? Life's a journey. We're going to get hit with stuff. And you either take it, take it on, head on, and say, all right, let's go. We're, we're, I'm going to do my very best. Or you just let it happen to you. And that's what you're talking about with the culture, is we let the culture dictate our life. Mm -hmm. And I'm with you. I don't have many friends. And I tell people, I'm not many friends. When I was in chiropractic school, I thought everyone like loved chiropractic. It was the greatest thing. I'd get adjusted. I'd feel amazing. I would heal so fast. I was learning about nutrition and exercise. I get out and I join the real world. And I'm like, where are these people? You're kid you don't like to be adjusted? You don't like to feel good? Like, where are you? I'm like, oh my gosh, we got a big, big journey. So as we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of pull this together towards the end. We uh, we'll spend as much time as you need. Um, so you, you're at this point, you're doing all these, these tasks. What would you say to the listeners out there that are listening saying, wow, where do I go from here? Where do I start? Where's, where do I, I, I want to make a shift. And I always tell people, you're not going to make a 360 shift. The shift has to happen in your head first. And once that happens, you've got to start preparing. You have to start buying. I, 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 in a mastermind group. And I talked to other chiropractors. I was this morning, I woke up early, couldn't sleep last night because the question was by one of the docs, how do you keep yourself motivated to, to stay sh in shape? And I'm like, I got this one, man. I, I got this one. So I couldn't sleep because it was on my mind because I have looked at it is if they're asking for some help, this can either break their life and health or to ruin it. My responsibility is to give them the utmost best answer I can give. So I couldn't sleep. I woke up at like five o'clock. I ran downstairs, got out on my porch, and I heard the birds. And I'm writing out a 15-step, you know, process on what they need to do. And I'm going to write it up, type it up, and send it to them. And it was it was all about you know getting your mind ready, writing out a plan, and then getting what you need. I said buy new clothes, buy new, buy a gym membership, buy fitness magazines, subscribe to them, get it all around you. So then your friends become, it's, you know, what you're reading and listening to. I said, get on a few podcasts. You mm -hmm. have to be obsessed with it. And when you're obsessed with it, it gets the fire going. And then you don't have to maybe be as obsessed later on, which you, you still will, but you got to get the fire going. So how do we get the fire going? How do they, how do we get them to become obsessed to start moving into this biohacking? And they're probably wondering what's biohacking. They'll have to go look it up. What would your advice be there? It's really interesting because, you know, once I healed, just to let you know um, how powerful I think my answer is, is um, once I healed and realized that my healthcare was free and accessible, I don't know if you know this, but I sold all my possessions, went on social media and said, anyone in America who's sick or suffering or in need, just reach out to me. If you're willing to let me sleep in your house, I'll live with you for four days and teach you everything I know. So I toured America for almost four years living in strangers' homes. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And... I really thought that I would be teaching people about food, that that was going to be the missing piece that they needed was that learn how to navigate their new kitchen. You know, if you're going to get conscious about food. And I saw that a lot of people were eating really healthy, um, but having no positive changes in their life. And then I saw people that were eating really poorly, but yet having miraculous changes. And I, you know, I, I'm a psychology major and I study community, specialize in community. And I'm thinking, you know, what, how is this happening? They're still eating that standard American diet, but they're having a really good, you know, change in, in healthcare, in their health. And it's all the lens, the conversation that you're having here that produces these changes. And for me, 
the part in me that I discounted in my healing journey was all the work I did on my psyche to see all of these changes as a self-love lens. I am doing them because I want to live optimally in my body, not because I'm afraid of MS, not because I'm living in fear. If, and I think that what happens is a lot of times what people are like, okay, I'm going to do you know, keto or paleo or whatever it is, a whole 30 of this or that, you know, ketotarian, whatever it is, I'm going to do that because that's what I need to do to get better. And it would be better to have a lens where it's like, okay, my body's not happy right now. I need to figure out a way to peacefully coexist. I'm going to start biohacking, experimenting with some changes in my body to see what it likes and doesn't like so we can live in harmony together. That's a much nicer lens to get to a healing place. And the other thing is, is that you need community support. So like you were saying, buy the books, listen to the podcast, you know, follow the bloggers, reach, like I reached out to Dr. Walls, Dave Asprey, like they didn't, they didn't plan on becoming friends with me. I like pushed myself on them, Mm -hmm. like became their, you know, commenting on everything they wrote, went to places they were so I could meet them. Like I did all that, you know? because I wanted to ask, you know, questions and dive deeper. So I think, you know, that, and the other thing is, is you need to kind of be nice to yourself and realize you didn't get here overnight. So slow, steady, sustainable steps. So when I make a change, I make the change for at least 90 days. You know, it's always funny when people are like, oh, I gave up gluten. I had no, nothing happened. So I'm like, well, how long did you give it up for? They're like, like a week. And I'm like, why don't you give it up for a year and get back to me? Because I guarantee anybody, I don't care who you are, if you give up gluten for a year, in one year, you're going to have a different body physically and mentally than you do now. I'm sorry. No one is going to tell me that wouldn't be true. They're just not because all I need to do is even be around gluten and my body blows up at this point. You know? So I just feel like, um, you know, for me, it, it really boils down to the psychological lens that you're using is the most important thing. And again, it's not really what you're eating, it's why you're eating that. And, you know, we are a society that says, if you eat pizza and get heartburn, take Tums. You need to stop living in that place. If you eat pizza and get heartburn, stop eating pizza. Or maybe say, okay, is it the pizza? What is it? Is it the cheese? Is it the tomato? Is it the gluten? The next time I eat cheese, I'm going to see how I feel. The next time I eat, so break it down to elimination to know what is it that's bothering me. Don't tell your body, I'm going to ignore that heartburn and give myself some over-the-counter medicine to ignore what you're telling me. And I'm going to continue to self-abuse. That's the lens that has to change. And that is outside of society because that's not what we're taught. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, that lens, that's the magic. That's where magic happens because when my, I was a um, health and phys ed major before chiropractic, I taught for a few years. And when I was in school, I was studying fitness and exercise. I loved that stuff. And I loved how it changed the brain and the body. And I think I saw it differently than, than what most other students saw, but my dad dies at age 50 of heart failure. And that was a day that I said, you know what, this is not happening to me. This is not happening. So my, my, I had a shift at that point and I didn't know where it was going, going and I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any, I didn't know anything about chiropractic. I didn't know anything about nutrition, um, longevity of exercise, all these things that, that, that Dave Asprey talks about in all his books. And, you know, there's so much out there. I didn't have that. But what I did have is I changed my thought and I, and I drew a line. And once there was a, there was a young guy in today, a patient and he stopped smoking. Well, I talked to him today. So, you know, how's it going? He said, I haven't had a cigarette. I had one like a week ago. And I said, you know what you have to do? And and this can apply to everyone out there. After this show, I would say, go and do this and see if you agree with this. Is I said, when you get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, and I said, say your name and say, I am not a smoker. I am not a smoker. Don't say, I want, I don't want one. I, I, I'm trying to quit. Say, I am not a smoker. I said, if you put LSD on the table or acid and said, hey, you want, want some? I'm like, what? I don't do that. It's not me. That's, right. I, there's no way. Uh, I said, once you, once you say that, 
And he goes, well, that changed me. And I said, well, <laughs> it takes repetition. You have to, your subconscious has to believe it. But for you to believe it, you better say it over and over and over. And all of a sudden you become it. So when my yeah. dad died and I said, no way, I am not doing it. I became uh, obsessed with exercise and, and training and stuff like that. And then when I moved to Florida, I kept going with, it. I started playing rugby at that time. And then I, I heard, you know, I was getting hurt. So I went to chiropractic, went to chiropractic school. But so that was the, my journey because I opened up my mind. That was the path that I was bound to take. So I was so, I was so excited that I hurt my back when I was 17 and I had pain because I would have never found chiropractic. Um, so they, 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 hopefully after this show, their, their psychological lens, they say, ding, I agree. I've got to make a change. What are some practical steps they can maybe apply that you would say uh, to those, those new people that are just like, uh-oh, now what? Um, what? What would you say would be, you know, a good, a good stepping stone? You know, for, I, I think it would be first have an honest conversation with yourself and what would be like the easiest area to make change in? Mm -hmm. Is it adding movement to your day, looking at the foods that you eat, me adding meditation? Because you want to start in a way that's going to resonate with you because one you know, like for me, I always wanted to learn how to meditate successfully. And I just kept, I, I couldn't figure it out until I went to live with monks. And um, so adding meditation to my daily life and yoga to my daily life was an easy first step for me because it resonated and was super approachable for me after years of trying to figure out what form of exercise was the right one, you know, so find what it is and start there. And if, Food is an area that you're like, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I would really just recommend every time you're going from the, today, this moment on, if you take something out of your cabinet, read the ingredients, just become aware of what it is you are currently putting in your body. And you might be shocked to see that, oh my gosh, everything has sugar in it. Or, oh my God, there's a lot of words here that I don't even know what they are. That's just now, now there's awareness. Okay. So I've realized that all the ingredients of all my condiments that I give my kids, the ketchup, the mustard, is four different types of sugar. So now that you have that information, because I never read ingredients, I didn't have, what are you going to do about it? So you know what I mean? Like, just become aware of what you're already doing, because I would bet that you're living on autopilot and you're not conscious. So the first step would be just to maybe open your eyes. And then the next step would be, to say to yourself, okay, if I was going to make a change, what is a sustainable change that I can make? And pick the one that's going to be the easiest, not the hardest, because it's just like once you lose, if you want to lose weight, once you lose a couple pounds, it motivates you to keep going, right? So pick something, you know, Kaiser Permanente, not that I like them or know anything about them, does have this one commercial that I see every once in a while that I love where, the, you know, this woman shows up at a yoga class and she doesn't like that. She shows up at you know, one of those classes where you're hanging from like silks or whatever. It's like, I don't even know what it is. She doesn't like that. She goes to another, like a bowling. She doesn't like that. And then she's like walking in a park with her headphones and smiling. Like she just kept figuring out what was her movement. What was her exercise that was going to work, you know? And I think that's what it is. You have to, you know, really ask yourself, what can I do? that I'm going to be able to sustain? What movement can I commit to? You know, not everybody is like me and you that's like, yay, I can't wait to work out. I love it. You know, I do. Like, it's my joy is getting on that yoga mat. Like, I get so, and I always say to my daughter, I just don't understand how the whole world doesn't want to wake up to the sunrise, listening to music or birds on the yoga mat with, you know, incense and candles. Like, why doesn't everybody want to wake up like that? She's like, mom, that like, doesn't sound appealing to me. And I'm like, okay, well, what is appealing to you? To just wake up and go to work every day is, just seems like you're not living. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it's, it's, if we don't wake up, we get to the end of our life or somewhere in life and go, oh crap, where, where are we? Why did I do this? And that goes back to the cultural thing. I, I, those are amazing that's amazing advice. And that's one of the things I covered today when I talked to my mastermind group. I said, you have to, you have to write out all your goals, what you like, and then narrow it down to the simplest, easiest thing that you can have success, success at. 
If it's three days a week, 20 minutes, do it and lock it in for 30 days and then add another piece. I yep. said, because if you make it too hard, you're not going to do it. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to run a marathon. Let me run 10 miles. Ah, so just, just start with a mile. Don't do it to yourself. You, you, you and I may be able to do that. I, I've done that. I've trained for a marathon in four months and I killed myself. That's not good. I'm better playing rugby, believe it or not. I'm, I'm better <laughs> like running around getting hit than trying to run 26 miles. Um, well, can you tell the listeners, we're going to have all, all, the, all your contact information in our show notes. That we easily, all you have to do is click and go right to her, her page. Um, but tell, us, tell the listeners where they can find you, what you do, kind of your programs. Um, I, you're an amazing person, and I, I'm so glad we had you on. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, your lens is super inspiring as well. And, you know, Pittsburgh is lucky to have you and uh, teaching and, and keeping its, its community healthy through, you know, a holistic lens and a chiropractic lens. Um, Paleo Boss Lady, uh, my website, social media is Paleo Boss Lady. That's where you can find me. Um, I'm mainly on Facebook, Instagram, and I have a website with a blog. And um, yeah, I mean, pretty much everything I do, you can find out there. I do teach at Antioch University, so you can take classes with me online, continue education. And uh, I'm on iHeartRadio, uh, uh, One Life Radio fairly often. You can usually catch me there. And um, I answer everyone, so if you ever have any questions or just need to know, you know, I know a lot of people. So if I can't answer the question, I can certainly refer you to someone. Um, and you know, all of my, everything that's out there is just readily accessible. You're, you're wonderful. And I truly believe you will answer everyone because you just have that heart. So if you're listening saying, man, I'd like to learn more, just go to the website, click on it, check, check her out, listen to the, the Ted talk, start, start, tasting this start getting it in your mind and and just start playing with it because one thing will lead to another to another and just like these podcasts you know just you've got to share these with your friends people don't know about podcasts and one podcast one interview like this could be the tipping point for somebody and i i don't think it's a tipping point where oh i'm going to be a little bit better it could be life and death the where you were at you were there my story Dr. And, Terry Rawls, all these people I found through the internet. And had you not gone to, to Burning Man, it would have been probably something else because you were on that journey. It was boom, your life, you are living. And not only are you living, but you're changing lives. So please share this. Let everyone know. Let's make you famous. And let's, let's get this podcast resonating over TV and radio. We know how that is. So uh, I, I so much appreciate you being on. Um, as we end, any fun, crazy plans for the near future? Well, believe it or not, I'm, right now, two exciting things are happening. I'm in escrow to buy a home that I'm really excited about, and I'm going to be a grandma. My daughter, my only child, is expecting my first grandchild, and both of those are happening in the next three weeks at the same time. So it's kind of <laughs> crazy because I lived in a van up until a year ago, and I was homeless three years before that because I was a missionary serving all over America for free. I actually uh, was in Pittsburgh at, what is that cute little bookstore, that in the Penguin, the Penguin bookstore, I think it's called, uh, with uh, Will Cole. I did some stuff in Pittsburgh when I toured. Um, but so I'm, you know, buying a home and I just can't even believe it. So that's what is happening for me personally. And professionally, I'm expanding my brand to include a lot of other voices. So you know, I'm really excited to bring, just like you're bringing voices, uh, I'm going to start, um, you know, with more guests, just expanding uh, so I can share more and have experts share more about some of the things that I'm not an expert on, but yet they do help my life. You know, I am a minimalist. I, I am a gardener, but I'm not a master gardener. So like those kinds of things. So it's just a lot of exciting stuff and, and just trying to navigate 2020 healthy. I love it. And then 2021 will bring some new challenges. But I love those too. It's, but you're going to be a rock star grandma. You're going to be, well, yeah, it was funny when, I don't know what you're going to be called. Did you think of a name yet? Like, Nona. is it going to be grandma? What is Nona. it? Nona. Nona. When I, it's funny when I, 
my kids think I'm, they know I'm crazy. I said, my, when my daughter was going to have her son, I said, okay, I'm going to be called grandpa. I said, that, that's not going to fly. I said, it's not grand. So I looked up cool grandpa names. Why well, I got these, these like rap star names. I'm like, what is this? I kept coming up with crazy names. I'm like, these are grandpa names. These are like, I don't know what they were. And I came up, I, I found chief and I'm like, chief, Hey, I want to be called chief. And my kids are like, we're not calling you chief dad. I'm like, no, no, the grandkids will call me chief. I said, that's just, that's just the way it's going to go. And they're like, dad, you're crazy. And I said, you're not calling me grandpa. Grandpa is old. I said, I'm still kicking butt. I said, you're going to call me chief. They don't call me chief. They call me Papa. But I'm like, all right, that'll, that'll fly. But, yeah, my daughter but, wanted to be Noni. And I said, no, I want Nona. That's just Italian. It's either Noni or Nona. My mother was Noni, and that's fine for her, but I prefer Nona. So we did have an argument because she's like, well, I just wanted to be Noni. And I'm like, well, you don't really have a say. So, <laughs> so we'll see when my granddaughter gets here what she calls me. But they did make me two signs for Mother's Day that say Nona's house and Nona's garden. So I'm thinking because they made me signs, they're letting me have my say. Um, I love it. I can't wait to be a grandma. I love it. You're going to be a rock star. I'm still trying to convince my, my grandkids to call me chief. Uh, it may, it may come down the road, but um, I'll call you chief. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show. Our listeners, I'm sure are thrilled to death. Uh, and I encourage everyone to check the website. I go to paleo boss, paleo boss lady, right? Yeah. Paleo boss lady.com. Um, it's amazing stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Namaste.